Wow, it's good to be back. It is good to be back. Hey, I'm in the ESV today. I'm usually not, but that's what I have, this big, thick thing. So just so you know what, it's scripture time here. <laughs> hey, it's really good to be back. It's good to see you. Uh, hi to the staff. I didn't get to say hi to yet, so I tried to see as many as possible. I, we just came in town a couple of days ago, and uh, still, I think, getting over our jet glad We're doing better. It's really great to be back, and... Uh, so hello to everybody. I feel like I didn't do anything today, which is really great. I am going to speak with you, but the sons and daughters have really stepped up, and I, I feel the Lord's presence, and I, I, you know, thank you, staff, and amazing folks. So, um, yeah, our sabbatical is a, a two-part. We just had six weeks. We were with uh, the Staley family. My, uh, Caroline's my sister, and two of our kids. We had a family vacation in Mexico followed by went, uh, when I went to see our son graduating for college. We went out to see that. And then um, we went to Europe. We just got back from 30 days in Europe. And uh, we hiked on the El Camino, the French route. Not the whole thing, but just 80 miles of that. We probably put in 190 miles over tw- four weeks. And uh, we were, um, it was really a good time. We were in London for about five days. And uh, time with our aunt. Uh, we also were with one of our missionaries, uh, Violet Adnorolov, uh, who is at Harpenden y- um, YWAM. She's actually helped coordinate all the worship and the events for the London Send that's happening today. So Lord, I bless Violet. I guess there's five or 6,000 registered. We thank you for the work she's put in networking the worship leaders in the UK the four other sins that she'll be coordinating. And Lord, we just bless her work there. Then we went to Valencia, Spain, and we have another missionary family, the Thomas family. Some of you may not know them. They are church planting there. We got to see the church plant and, uh, and then minister in a, a South American church just outside Valencia on the Holy Spirit, which was fun. It was an evangelical church and then pray with them about their city uh, then we flew to Santiago uh, de Compostelo in Spain where we met with the most interesting group. They're experiencing revival in the Catholic Church in Spain. And Brother Carlos, who was just at Bethel and Pastor Luis, an evangelical, have come together to bring a blend and emerge of the Catholic and the evangelical charismatic movement and went to a Ruach meeting. And there was a Catholic nun sitting behind me just singing in the spirit. And I'm like... I can't believe, it felt like Bridgeway. I couldn't believe what was happening. It's like, whoa, this is something else. And they, they are seeing a move in uh, the Hakuna, which is a young movement that started in 2010 of Catholic youth baptizing thousands. And there's a lot of prophetic words about believing for Spain to be revived. And the Catholic church is so deep in Spain and France and the whole continental Europe that it will take revival in the Catholic Church to see that. So very encouraging to see that. We, we then hiked with some pastors, Jim and Pam Tarr from the Western Slope and Basalt and Tracy Evans from Mozambique. We, we had days together. We had a number of encounters on the trail. We, we knew we would have that. And first day, we literally at breakfast, at when we got to our starting point, there's a, a woman from Perth, Australia that was burned out and I said, well, what are you here for? Are you on a spiritual pilgrimage? She said, I don't know. I just need direction. And Gwen and I to this day can't remember what we said to her, but she started crying. We prayed for her. And I don't know how she caught us up. We hiked 80 miles in seven days. But, you know, on the last day, she was a day behind us. She caught up. And she told us that moment, like, literally shifted. She said, I'll remember what you said for the rest of my life. And we're like... What did we say? Well, I'm like, I have, you know, it's just, and Gwen had just been praying for Korea. We saw all the nations there from all over the world, literally. And lo and behold, 30 seconds later, we approach a woman from South Korea that had just hiked 500 miles, starting in France and across all through Spain. She got two or three encounters with her. Um, we met, then met a woman from Israel, and I was really shocked with how secular the Israelis are, and the Lord set up four meetings over eight days, including the last day. We stayed an extra day, and we were in some random park outside town, and there she was, and we got to share about the Lord. It was just really interesting to watch those encounters, but really refreshing time, and then we went to Marseille, France, 
um, where we ministered with Remy and Sarah, and we were part of their home church night. Um, right now, they're entertaining 40 Arabs and Israelis in their home from the land of Israel. They're coming over, most of them Messianic at the Israeli level. They do a lot of hosting um, and preaching around the, the Europe, so we had a great time there. So that's kind of what we've been about, and I, I, a couple of impressions that, that stood out to me. I think we went to nine or 10 different church expressions. The church in Marseille was very much like um, Bloom Church here, or maybe the Pearl Church. Uh, we went to a Catholic mass with people from all over the world in Santiago, the Basilica actually, of the Apostle James. And uh, we were able to take communion with people from all over the world in, in a mass. And so we saw an Anglican church in the UK, a Catholic church, an evangelical, charismatic, Holy Spirit meeting. I mean, just the gamut, house church. And we realized the beauty and diversity of the body of Christ. And there's this universal hunger for revival. There's this sense that the era has shifted with COVID that the church is discovering itself again and everyone's worried about the same things. Um, uh, in France, there, today is the conclusion of an election and there's a radical right and left candidates and they were all just like freaking out and same thing in the UK, they just had the elections on June 4th. So everywhere we went, it felt like a mirror of like it's one world and there's, right now the sense I came away with is the church needs to be in revival. It's the only answer for the issues at hand. It won't be political solutions. It will be a revived church that has the Holy Spirit and it becomes agents of transformation. So we've got to pray for revival in Spain, revival in France, revival at this Anglican church in Billington, uh, UK. So what a, what a fun time it was. And I, thank you for letting us be gone. And so... Um, I'm just gonna actually pray for revival for that content for here because it's something I was doing when we talked earlier about redigging the ancient wells. So Father, I just thank you that you want to revive your church, that you wanna raise up reformers to be agents of change in a time when the world desperately needs you, when civilization has moved in an anti-God agenda. They've cast out the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Christian roots, and they are now experiencing the trauma of a godless generation. And so, Father, would you raise up a church in revival? Would you visit us here in Bridgeway, in Denver, in the Pastors for 400, which is Monday, in, in all, the, all the churches in Europe, in the Catholic Church, the Evangelical Church, the Home Church? Father, we just ask you for revival, and we ask for your mercy Come quickly, Holy Spirit, come quickly, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray, amen. Well, I'm gonna speak on a, a subject that I, I got to read three books while I was gone, and um, um, one of them was uh, by uh, uh, prophetic voice Patricia King, and it was talking about the new era. I think you all have heard over the last year, I've been thinking about what is it, what's God saying to the church, you know, chapter one, her first point, it, she has 20 points of the new era, and I won't cover those today, but was a radical focus on Jesus only. And we really heard that everywhere we went the last uh, six weeks. Um, her second chapter is it will be an era of reformation. And it really caught my attention because it's different than revival. Um, renewal is when the church experiences a fresh move of the Holy Spirit, Revival is where it spills out and the lost are saved, but reformation is when culture is impacted. So you had reformation in Europe and it changed the face of church and it changed culture. When Wesley's revival uh, happened, the UK was changed. The Great Awakenings, uh, first and second Great Awakening changed culture. And so she was speaking about that. So I've been asking the Lord, like, what's it mean to have a reformation spirit? Do I have the courage to be that? And uh, then I, I read two other books on Kindle, um, Jonathan Kahn, uh, The Return of the Gods and um, The Josiah uh, Mandate, and just been pondering and asking the Lord, Lord, what's it look like? And just saying, okay, Lord, I'm willing to, I don't wanna be the old fogey that says, well, in my days, it was like this. It's like, no, what is God doing now? 
And what does it mean to be a church that will reform things that, that we see confronting us? So it's kind of been clunking around and I was thinking about the revivals in the Bible. I'm gonna read a couple of scriptures. You don't need to bring these up unless you have time for it, but this is out of Zechariah 1 verse three. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me and I will return to you. And the Hebrew word there is shuv, which is also shuva is repentance. So if you repent and turn from your ways and look to me, I will return to you from my distance and I will visit you again. And it comes to a prophet Zechariah, which means God remembers. And it's in the context of if my people, well, there's the next one, 2 Chronicles 13, 14. When I shut up the heavens, there's no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, shiva from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. Um, Finally, Joel chapter two. I thought I might preach out of Joel, but I, I think I'm gonna do um, 2 Chronicles 34 today. Um, Joel two says this, now therefore says the Lord, this is verse 12, turn to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. In, in other words, they tore their garments when they were in repentance, and the word was actually repent in your heart, not just externally or with words only, but let it be a heartfelt repentance. Return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if we will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind it, enough for a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. The idea there is that um, there is always hope in times of darkness. In the times of Zechariah, the nation had turned from the Lord and Zech they were trying to rebuild the temple. It's one of the prophets that after Cyrus issued a decree, they came back with great zeal to rebuild the temple and it sat idle for 14 years. And then Zechariah and Haggai come along to encourage them to rebuild the temple. And the, the opening stanza of Zechariah, the first prophetic voice Haggai also speaks uh, is return to the Lord and I'll return to you. Haggai says, you're building your paneled houses, but you've neglected the house of the Lord. Return to me and the desire of the nations will come. And it's kind of this idea of a call to repentance, similar with Joel. And in the context of Joel, the Assyrian army is coming in. And the idea is if they repent, and I didn't read all of it, but when the priests weep in the porch and the altar, God will restore the Israelites, bring them back to the land, and in the latter days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Joel 2, 28, we know that, which happened at Acts 2. And my spirit will be poured out on all flesh. So big idea of some of this is in the darkest of times, the answer is the Lord. Not legislative or political solutions necessarily. While we must stand for those things, it's in the Lord and it's in revival. And there's this stirring for repentance. So everywhere we were at was this move of seeking God's face and saying, Lord, how do we position our hearts to seek you and come into your presence? So um, just giving that as a backdrop. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read um, 2 Chronicles 34, one to seven, I, I know many of us are not all that versed in Old Testament, but I will try to make the bridges to new and to today. Um, what's interesting, we know from um, Paul's writing to the Corinthians that what happened in the Old Testament in natural events was a prophetic picture that was a sign for the church of God's spiritual principles. Paul's very clear about that. So Christ was the bread from heaven where there was manna. He is the living waters that would pour out the spirit, which was the water from the rock. And it talks about that and saying that the examples of the Old Testament, including its judgments, are examples for us today. And, and Paul's encouragement was, don't go to false idols, but pay attention to what happened in the old. So 
that's the context in which I come into this. And let me read the first seven verses of Second Chronicles 34. So now I am in the ESV. <laughs> it says, um, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign as king. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And here's the Lord's comment on his life. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of David his father and he did not turn aside to the right or the left hand, the right hand or the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, so he'd be 16 years old, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David, his father. That's interesting. We have a 16-year-old who's seeking God and is about to bring one of the greatest revivals and reformation in Israel's history. Began to seek the God of David, his father, and in the 12th year of his reign, that would be 20, when he becomes of age, is considered an adult able to make legislative decisions. In the 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherim, this is from the goddess Asherah, the carved images and metal images, and they chopped down the altars of the Baals, the Baals, in his presence. And he cut down the incense altars that stood above them, and he broke in pieces the Asherim, this would be the idol pieces, the, the carvings, then the metal images, and he made dust of them and scattered it over the graves of those who had sacrificed them. And he also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem and in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon as far as Naphtali in the ruins all around. So this is both in southern and northern Israel. He broke down the altars and beat the ashram and the images into powder and cut down all the incense altars through all the land of Israel. Then he returned to Jerusalem. So he's beginning a time of reform. Now let me give you a little context on what Asherah bales and these like images and what's going on with this. Um, in the context is um, there was a split after David There was a split with Solomon. Solomon started well, but ended poorly. And he had a half heart towards the Lord. And those that came to reign after Solomon, they split Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south. And both of those kings brought apostasy into the land. Uh, um, uh, Jeroboam in the north was afraid that all of Israel would join with Judah in the south, uh, I mean, Rehoboam's land. So what he did is he erected golden calves. By the way, the symbol of Baal is a calf. The Baal of Egypt was a calf. This is the sin of Exodus 32 when they built a golden calf. And by the way, we still have the calf god because a bull market is also the same symbol. And Baal is the god of provision and fertility through human means. So um, they erected a golden calf up in the north in Dan and also in uh, Bethel. And I've been to Bethel and you can see the ruins of Jeroboam's altar in Bethel. Bethel was the place where God met Jacob and said, the open heaven, the angels, I will give you all of this land and my covenant will be promised. And in that very place, there was an erection of a Baal altar, which they sacrificed to Baal on the very place that was the house of God. And then Rehoboam was an evil king. And we see that what happened is there were good kings and bad kings in in the southern tribes of Judah And you had various times of reformation. Asa came and brought reforms. By the way, Asa, we bless Asa as a reformer. That's, I'm looking (laughs) at these guys over here, they're oldest. And um, we had Hezekiah, we had um, various kings. There were four or five that brought reformation. And Josiah was late. And I was asking the Lord, like, like, where are we in the timeline? Because we've had some revivals in Western civilization that has begun to turn itself from God. We've had the Great Awakening, we had the Reformation, the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, the Welsh Revival, the Latter-day 
um, uh, re, uh, or latter rain, excuse me, revivals of the 50s, the Jesus People Movement. We've had some revivals. We had the revival in Toronto. But where are we in the timeline? How late? And I think we're later than some of those early kings like Asa. And I'm wondering, Jonathan Kahn would say we're in the time of Josiah, which was the last reformation before judgment came. Now, I hope we're not there. I hope we're earlier in the timeline. But I'm talking nations, the, the Western civilization. But let me, let me, so what happened is Manasseh brought it in. I want you to hear the, the gods that came in. You remember, I, I didn't get to hear all the sermons, but Daniel spoke on Ephesians for four weeks. Peter Sternholm spoke on the fear of the Lord last week, and I loved the little pot and the clay and um, his analogy about obeying the, the commands of the Lord. And, um, and Daniel, in his last message, talked about standing and that our struggles are not against flesh and blood, people, but powers and principalities and rulers in dark places. So could it be that there are rulers in dark places that actually affect the nations of the earth? So in um, Manasseh's day, and I'm just gonna turn a couple of pages. Oops, I'm too far. Manasseh, it's in um, chapter 33, right before we are. He reigned 55 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations which the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Remember, the promise was, if you come into the land, do not make covenant with the false gods or it will be your ruin, but rather make Yahweh your king and establish the Lord as the center. He built high places his father Hezekiah had torn down. He erected altars to the Baals and made Asherah and worshiped all the hosts of heavens and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, that's where my name shall be forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in two courts of the house of the Lord. And he burned his sons in offering in the valley of Hinnom, that's the God Moloch. And used fortune telling and omens and sorcery dealt with mediums and necromancers. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and provoked the Lord to anger. His son, Amnon, was so wicked that they killed him after two years, and then they took an eight-year-old Josiah and put him in place. And just so you get sort of the context of what it meant to tear this down, um, actually, you know the history of, of Jeroboam. I need to give this, because um, this is in 1 Kings 13. It's important to set the context of what's happening because Josiah is about to break an altar. And that's what reformers do. They break altars. They're opposed to the kingdom. This is chapter 13. What's happened is Jeroboam has erected the two golden calves and he's gone to Bethel. This is in chapter 12. He said he went up to the altar he'd made in Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month in the month that he divides in his own heart and he instituted a feast for the people and went up to the altar of Baal to make an offering at the very place called the house of God. And behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make offerings and the man cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name. And he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high place who are making offerings on you and human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day saying, this is a sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against him at the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar and said, seize him. By the way, that's what happens when we let Baal into our culture is they oppose the prophetic voice of God. And his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up so that he could not draw it back to himself. And the altar was torn down and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. 
And then the king entreats him like, have mercy, pray for me. And his hand is restored. But what's key is this is at Bethel, there was a word that a man named Josiah would come and break down the altar and burn the bones of the priest that sacrificed there. Just for history. Isn't it crazy how like hundreds of years earlier, God knows things. By the way, some of you have been known while, by the way, Jeremiah was a prophet during the time of Josiah, as was Zephaniah. And the word to Jeremiah was, I've known you in your mother's womb and you will be a prophet to the nations. Both Jeremiah and Zephaniah prophesied and called the nation to repentance during the time of Josiah. And um, so this word has come by a prophet. And then I want you to hear um, 2 Kings um, chapter... um, Where is it? 22, and it's in, um, that's in 23, excuse me, verse four. Chapter 23, verse four. Listen to what Josiah does with the reforms and what he's tearing down. I want you to hear what he's tearing down, and I'll give you background on what he's torn down. The king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priest of the second order and the keepers of the threshold, that's the door piece, to the temple of the Lord, that all the vessels made for Baal and for Asherah and for the hosts of heaven to be brought out and he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. And he deposed the priest whom the kings of Judah had ordained to make offering in the high places. These are the apostate places. In the cities of Judah and around Jerusalem, those who also burned incense to Baal and to the sun and moon and constellations. By the way, that was Asherah was uh, associated with the sun and the moon. And um, the host of heaven, and he brought out the Asherah from the house of the Lord outside Jerusalem, the book Kidron, and burned it at the book Kidron and beat it to dust and cast the dust upon the graves of the common people. This would be where they had sacrificed their children to Molech in Gehenna. I know this is kind of a hard word. Are you guys all right? You're breathing? Okay. I am rested. Um, I'm rejuvenated in the Lord, but I'm sobered. Like, what's Reformation look like? So anyway, here we go. <laughs> oh, where was I? And he broke down the house of the male cult prostitutes who were in the house of the Lord and where the women who wove, wore, wove hangings for Asherah. And he brought all the priests of the cities that defiled the high places where the priests made offerings from Geba in the north to Beersheba in the south. And he broke down the high places of the gates that were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which was on the left, uh, one on the left of the gate of the city. However, the priests of the high places did not come to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among their brothers. And he defiled Topeth, which is in the valley of the son of Himmon. This is the Gatha, that they might, the, that no one might burn his son or daughter as an offering to Molech. They actually were offering their sons and daughters to the God of Molech in the valley of Hinnom, which is right outside the walls of Jerusalem. And he removed the horses the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance of the house of the Lord. Do you hear how apostate the nation is? By the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain who was in the precincts, he burned the chariots of the son of sons with fire, the altars on the roof of the upper the chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, the altars that Manasseh had made in the two courts of the Lord. He pulled down and broken pieces and cast uh, dust off them into the brook of Kidron, defiled the high places that were to the east of Jerusalem, to the south, the mountain of corruption, which Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth. This, by the way, the Asherah has got several names. Estarte in the Sumerian, um, Aphrodite in Greece, Artemis in Ephesus, um, Ashtoreth in the south, the abomination of the Sidon's Chemosh, 
the abomination of Moab, the Milcom, the abomination of the Amalites. By the way, these are other names for Baal, Asherah, and Molech. Broken pieces, etc. Moreover, the altar at Bethel, the high place erected by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, the altar of the high place, he pulled down, burned, and reduced it to dust, and he also burned the Asherah. And as Josiah turned to the tombs, he saw the tombs there of these worshipers of Baal. And he sent, now by the way, when you dig up a a grave, that's an ultimate defilement and dishonor, right? So it said he took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it. According to the word that the man of God had proclaimed that predicted these things hundreds of years earlier. And then he said, what is that monument I see? And the men of the city told him, it's the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and predicted the things you've done against the altar at Bethel. That's the first time he heard that he was actually prophesied. And he said, let him be, let no man move his bones. So they left his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. And Josiah removed all the shrines. It goes on and on. And then he returned to Jerusalem. So what's at stake here and what, are, what does it mean for us today? Um, Baal was the chief god of the pantheon of gods. So if you know your Greek and Roman mythology, which most of you had in school, you had Zeus, Ju- or Jupiter and Roman, Zeus and Greek, and there was this chief god that had the other gods in a pantheon. And if you worship Zeus, you got all the gods in the pantheon. And Zeus... And Baal had a wife called Asherah, also known as the Queen of Heaven. That's where you get the name if you've heard Queen of Heaven. And here's the characteristics. Baal's assignment was to turn nations away from Yahweh, the creator God and his worship. His image was the bull. And when you worshiped him, it gave way for all the other gods to come into the land in which he was honored. His name means Lord, owner, or master. That's the word Baal. It means master. The Bible speaks of both Baal, Belim, and the Baals. And when you accepted Baal, you accepted all of his gods. And the Baal promised, if you worship me, I will give you fertility, prosperity, fruitfulness, increase, and gain. And um, if you serve me and the queen of this pantheon of gods. Um, So what happened is God said to Israel, when you come in, don't worship those gods. But we found it happening. You heard of Ahab, right? And Jezebel had her altars to Baal and Asherah. And there's this confrontation on the mountain of Mount Carmel. Um, That was a revival in northern Israel. Josiah's in southern Israel. But what happened is they embraced Baal and they began to be syncretistic. At first it's like, well, we worship Yahweh, but you know, we might as well worship this too because it's what's in the land. It's, it's how this all works and we need our rain and yeah, Yahweh's good, but we need this. There was a, and this is why Elijah said, whom will you serve to whom this day? Is it Baal or is it Yahweh? It can't be both. Make a choice. And they, they did this. Well, Have we as Western nations that traditionally held to Judeo-Christian values, founded on the Ten Commandments, you may not know this, but there's a statue of the face of Moses and the Ten Commandments in our Supreme Court. And also in the House of Congress and Representatives is the face of Moses. So when you swear on a Bible, you're actually swearing on the Ten Commandments, but we've strayed from that by worshiping Baal. And so now we're trusting other things for our provision than the God of heaven. Does it sound familiar? By the way, how this works is when a nation, like it was under Joshua and David, is devoted to God, those things didn't ravage the land. But when you drive God out of the land, you open a gate for the demonic to come in. The scripture in Matthew 12, 43 says this. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking to rest and find none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came, i.e., who he was cast out of. This is Jesus speaking after he cast out a devil. And he was being criticized by the Pharisees for doing it 
by Satan, Beelzebub. And he says, I will return to the house from which I came. And when he comes and he finds it empty, i.e. not filled with God and not filled with the Holy Spirit, cast out but never filled. Swept and put in order, then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. And then Jesus says this in verse 45, so shall it be with a wicked generation. This wicked generation. His point is, if you cast God out of your house, the spirits that were cast out when Christianity came to the Western world will come in with vengeance. Is that scary or what? So we need God in the church. That's a good thing. We need Jesus as king. But our nations, the Western nations that have cast God out are experiencing some of the demonic principles. They put themselves under a false spirit. Does that make sense? So I think Baal is in our self-help books. It's in our magazines, our news media, our finances, our dependence on things other than God. And we're now mastered by some of the Baals of our culture. The answer is returning to God and he'll return to us. What about Asherah, uh, known as Ishtar in, in some of the ancient Sumerian, Akkadian places, goddess, Artemis, Ephesians, etc. Her realm was seductive, seductive, is that how you say it? Sexual promiscuity, breaker of rules, prideful, usurping authority, seducing to immorality, breaking covenants, including marriage, drugs and alcohol, drunkenness, deification of women, goddesses, sorcery, witchcraft. She was also given the title in the ancient Middle East, the queen of heaven. She was joined to celestial lights to the moon and to the sun, and was often named, their son was often named her brother. So do you see this, what had been erected in, in the temple of God? Um, she was the goddess of sexuality, and um, she was vindictive and destructive and made war against all of those who would resist her unbridled passions for sex and for the male and female prostitutes she put in her temples. In the ancient Akkadian, now I get this from Jonathan Kahn, looked at his research, looked at all the internet sites to see and do my own research on it. She, her marching, she had a month call of Tammuz, which is in the month of June in our calendar, which was, um, what she did in her temple was she blurred the distinction between male and female. She feminized men and masculized women. She had shrine prostitutes. They went through surgical alterations in her temple. She had a month dedicated to her worship. It was long and the prostitutes cross-dressed and the banner was a rainbow and the nations were told to take pride in her worship. I don't even need to comment. Could it be Western civilization has opened the gate to something more powerful that we have no idea what we're dealing with? Our struggle's not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. The question's gonna be, how do we repent? How do we turn to see the tide shift? Molech was the god of child sacrifice. Mothers and fathers would come the idea was if you sacrificed your young children, you will get prosperity in your land and your life will go well. In his epic poem, Paradise Lost, John Milton writes of this ancient God, quote, first Molech, horde king besmeared with the blood of human sacrifice and parents' tears. For through the noise of drums and timbrels loud, the children's cries were unheard as they passed through the fire to their grim idol. Cries unheard. So, when Christianity forces or other nations that were under Christian values push God out, we have a clash now with Christian values and with the gods of the age. 
Jonathan Kahn writes this in his book. Um, what was it that would cause a mother of ancient times to lift the child of her womb to Molech? For one thing, she believed that by so doing, she would obtain God's favor, her fields would be fruitful, she would be given prosperity, her life would be blessed, and her prayers would be given answers. I'm quoting Jonathan right now. So in the modern replaying, what would live a mo- lead a mother to kill her son or daughter in the womb? Most frequently, the answer given when surveyed is that if the child lived, it would hamper the mother's life, her time, her energy, her education, and career prospects, her future earning capabilities. The child would be a burden to her aspiration. So by aborting the child, the hindrance and burden would be removed and she would be in a better position to achieve her goals. Enough said. So that's the problem, what's the solution? Boy, that's heavy. God have mercy. I just felt like if there's a reformation spirit in the church, by the way, in the Old Testament, I gotta be really clear with this. The Old Testament was a theocracy under God as king. Remember, they were called out to be a kingdom of priests, a royal nation who would propagate the rule of God on the planet. That was the call in Israel. God was to be their king, and when they rejected God as king, the land went into apostasy. Every time God was placed as king, it went well. When they rejected apostasy, through these evil spirits came in. We are not a theocratic nation. In the New Testament, the church is called to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. In the Old Testament, it was a king who led a nation in righteousness. In the New Testament, it's the church that leads the nation in righteousness. Do you see the distinction? Jesus Christ came to pay the price to defeat the works of the devil and to forgive all sin and to provide a path of hope and restoration. And the first revival is in Acts chapter two. We have a revival in Ephesus. We have a revival in uh, Cornelius' household where Once they put God in, everything shifts. They burn their idols. In fact, they burned their idols to the God of, of, which one was in Ephesus? Um, Artemis. By the way, that's Asherah. I have, well, where are we on this? So right now, it's not a political solution, but it's a church that's the royal priesthood who will be the answer empowered by the Holy Spirit with a vision for righteousness. That is, I was aware of that on the walk. I could see how apostate Europe was. We are on the El Camino where you're supposed to stop in church after church and see the church of history. 90% of them were closed. We couldn't even get in the churches. And we realized the church is closed. (laughs) I'm like, oh, Jesus, there's a problem here. And everyone we talked to was on a spiritual quest but had no concept of God. I'm like, this is crazy. The one that did was the Korean lady that said, well, my dad was a Baptist pastor and I don't want that God, but I want to meet the real Jesus. The Israeli says, oh, I have no, we, we met her four times and had like five to 10 hours of conversation about the Lord with her. No concept. God, bring revival. Bring revival. So I want to give you a couple things I see in the text. Some principles. And I'm speaking to the church, not a political solution. And I'll just read off my notes here. First of all, because Josiah in the darkest of times of apostasy, and you all realize Jesus talked about this, in the latter days, the apostle Peter wrote about this in 2 Peter chapter three, in the latter days. Paul wrote about it to Timothy in chapter three and to the Thessalonians, the spirit of the Antichrist, men that were lovers of self, sexual perversion. Jude wrote about it. Jesus said, it will become darker, Right? And all of them said, repent, don't, don't participate in that. So what I wanna say is there's always hope for reformation and returning to God so his blessing returns to us. Yeah. I think we sang about it today. There's always hope. 
And I think it was Whitney that had the word that is those of you that feel like my dreams are dashed, there's no hope, where are we? We sang about letting go of the God of hopelessness, right? And that whole thing and welcome Holy Spirit. The orphan spirit out, Holy, what did we say? Something like that, Holy Spirit in. <laughs> and I was just listing that. I thought, yeah, that's exactly right. So there's hope, no matter how dark the time, God can work through a people to bring a reversal. I have hope for today. I'm hearing of revival in Spain. Remy was gonna minister. By the way, when we were at his house church, I met a Muslim, Muslim, Muslim from Morocco who had a divine encounter with Jesus and got saved and told me the story. And an atheist that had nothing about God who was angry, who had a visitation in her room and started shaking and got baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm like, okay, I get it, Lord. This is like really good. We're talking dark situations. There's a place of hope. So there's hope for us as a church, for our city, for America, for the Europe, for the Western civilization, there's hope because Jesus provided the answer. It's what, it's what um, Peter Sternholm spoke on last week. Second is, um, Josiah's revo- reforms began with a personal revival and reformation in his heart at age 16. It starts with your heart. First, I think Peter called us to that last week. Thirdly, God can use young people to achieve his purposes. Some of you are called to be reformers in this next generation. I'm speaking to some of you under 35. You're called to be reformers. You're called to speak the truth, to stand up, to be a voice. It's gonna be done in Jesus and in love. It's gonna be done with salvation but some of you know that there's a brand on your heart for reformation. Thirdly, or fourthly, do you notice his father was so wicked they killed him. His grandfather had brought in all of these idols into the temple of God. My point is this, one's parentage, the traumas, by the way, his dad is killed when he's eight. How many of you would that be like a trauma? People kill your dad at eight and then force you to be king. It's like, what? One's parentage, traumas, and upbringing does not necessarily determine the course of your life. Josiah had a different course. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what the heritage that's ungodly is. You have a different destiny in the Lord should you choose him. Really important. The other thing I noticed is Josiah had godly elders around him. I haven't read all the names because I'm gonna save the rest for next, but there's a, uh, Zephaniah, the prophet, was his cousin because he was a great, great grandson of Hezekiah. um, And Josiah is a great, great grandson of Hezekiah. So a prophet who is speaking to repentance is his cousin. Do you think he knew his cousin? Jeremiah is prophesying and was the son also of Hilkiah, which is one of the godly priests in the kingdom that's advising Josiah. So we have Jeremiah, this godly priest. We have Zephaniah. We have godly elders that are actually counseling an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old to help shape the destiny of a life to become a righteous reformer. So for those of us over 35, we actually have an assignment be those that raise up and bless and honor the reformers of our generation and teach them the ways of the Lord in a culture that's completely contrary to the living God. Is that making sense? The last point I'd make is Josiah needed to do something. He was courageous, he leaned on the Lord. He was not um, fearing man. Do you think that was unpopular what he did? Do you think there was some resistance? Probably. There's gonna be more. I've got more principles, but we're gonna save it for next week. So you gotta come back next week. I hear how it finishes. Um, But here's how I wanna close this. Um, I'm I'm gonna pray that God raises up reformers. And I would just say this. It's not through anger. It's not through violence. It's not through the ways of the world. 
The scripture is very clear that we, we, we wage war not as the world does, but we have divine power to demolish arguments and strongholds of thought that oppose themselves to Jesus Christ. We come with the truth. We come with love. We come with conviction. So I'm in the family of two homes. I'm sitting there with the Thomas family and their second son. I said, how's it going? He's in a, a British school, which is one of the hardest educationally in the world. And most of the students there are Muslim because there's a connection with South Spain and Morocco and Algeria and all those places. And he says, yeah, I'm sharing with my Muslim friends all the time. He was clear-eyed. He looked at us and said, here's how I'm standing against the culture. Here's what I'm doing. Here's how I've guarded my heart. And the kid was straight-eyed, looked square at me and was just as clear as a bell. And he was like all of 14 and he was standing for Jesus. Then, it, yeah, it was amazing. Then I'm in, I'm the Arnaud, that's Remy and Sarah's family and their oldest, Liel, and she says, yeah, everyone's opposed to God and they're constantly mocking me again in her culture. And I said, well, how do you stand? And she says, I'm really clear. She said, I tell my people I'm not opposing, I'm not forcing my ways on you, but here's where I stand. And she's standing for righteousness in her school. And she's not yet graduated high school. Both of those have the potential to be reformers in their generation. Do you see what it takes? I was, what a privilege to look at that. And by the way, it was an Algerian Muslim that got saved by divine encounter. And we got to prophesy over them in Remy. I did not know their background. I looked at this couple. So the atheist and the, and the Muslim got together. And I said, I don't know what God's doing. I don't sense it's right time, but you've there's going to be the power of God is going to rest on your life and you're, you're going to be reformers. You're going to be uh, people that will lead many to Christ. And you know, I just started, pro and I, I had no idea of their background and she's got a vision to go to Madrid and prophesy to Spain. And he's got a vision to reach his Muslim community in the south of France. And I'm just like, you got to be kidding. These kids are like barely married. They're barely saved. They're less than a year in the Lord and they're reformers. So I just saw the picture. I'm like, yeah, let's do this. So here's how I want to close today. I feel like um, there are some of you in the room and actually we, we've got, um, I'm going to have Jill Collis come up when I pray for you in a minute. We, we've got some people in the lobby. There's actually a couple things they want to get on the ballot. One is to have a, a, a place where the, the state can vote, can uh, male transgender com compete in women's sports they want to put that question on the ballot, a similar one on, um, oops, how do I say it? Jill, get, are you in the room? Where's Jill? I'll have you come up in a minute. But I, want to, I feel like some of you are stirred to be reformers. You kind of know, okay, this is that. And it's risky, right? It's really risky to be a reformer. Um, and I had to wrestle with this in my heart. And um, I thought about it. It's like, I felt like the Lord asked me, he said, Peter, are you willing to be a reformer? I'm like, well, Lord, it was disaster in the last election. Like we lost half the church. And you know, it was like the divisive spirit, by the way, um, hmm. <laughs> Ishtar's uh, key date was June 26th. The revocation of the protection of marriage was June 26th. Stonewall, which opened the LGBTQ agenda in New York 55 years ago, which Biden just visited, happened on June 26th. And the approval of gay marriage happened on June 26th. In the month of June, in the month of Tamar, or Tammuz. Remy said to me, because he's standing for Israel, there's, there's several things that create a crisis. One is an evil edict people willing to enforce it, and then the silent church that does nothing about it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sitting there going, oh, Lord, you know, like, what's this mean? I don't know, but some of you feel called. Some of you will be prayer warriors. Some of you will have a voice of just standing clear in your job. Some of you will be a voice in your neighborhood. Others of you are gonna train our children. By the way, it's the school, um, like if, if there's a transgender thing happening at school that... The, the thing on the ballots can be notify parents. Well, parents, you need to raise your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It's not the school's job. The school used to do that in our history. It does not do that now. It's your job. 
at the Sunday school, we're supporting you as families to bring in prophecy over the kids, to train them in that, but it's your job to be aware of what's happening. Just saying. So, Jill, do you want to tell us what we're signing or what you've got out there? And then I'm going to have the reformers. Those of you who feel called, we're going to invite you to come to the front. So let's find a microphone for you and tell us what you and your friends are doing. And uh, are you guys breathing? Is this like really sober? I mean, it's like... <laughs> Uh, push up, sorry. I didn't give it to you right. Here we go. There it is. Hello. Uh, first of all, I want to honor Peter and Bridgeway and the senior leadership team for um, the willingness to do this. Um, so I'm Jill Cullis, and I'm the resident political nerd in the room, in the house. Um, but we have, we have two petitions. Both of these have uh, gone through the Supreme Court. It was a very laborious process to, to get to, to this point. Um, we have um, uh, less than a month now, we've been working on it, but we have less than a month to get 200,000 signatures statewide. And all this will do, um, which is significant, is to put the issue on the ballot. We have two separate petitions two separate tables. So you go to one table, sign one petition. We have multiple of the same petition. Go to the next table, sign the next petition. One of the petitions, um, as Peter was mentioning, that if you are a biological, I'm a biological girl, but I go to school and I want to identify as a biological boy, one of the petitions says that parents have to be notified within 48 hours of the gender incongruency. That is not happening today. So it puts it onto the ballot so that the voters of Colorado can say, yes, parents should be notified of what's happening with their child in their school. Currently, that is not. The, and all of, both of these are for um, public schools, um, grades K through 12. The other is that if I am a biological boy, but I want to identify as a girl, I want to play on the girls' sports team, I currently can do that. This would not allow a biological boy to play on a girl's sports team. Men are stronger, you know. I mean, we're seeing, you know, all kinds of stories in the news of, unfortunately, young ladies being hurt because they're playing against boys that are just stronger and bigger and throw faster and harder and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but... Um, but there's two separate tables, so you must be a registered voter in Colorado. Um, and if you got a ballot at the early June, then you're a registered then you're a registered voter in Colorado. We would love to have you sign both of those. I have two friends who have joined me today to help answer any questions. Um, but again, we, I just really bless and honor Bridgeway for standing for righteousness for kids. This is about protecting kids, and you as the parents should be aware of what's really happening and what's going on. So again, we need to get 200,000 signatures before the end of July. Um, and so we're hoping that um, you guys will sign both of the petitions. So one table for one, one petition, the other table for the other petition. So again, thank you to Bridgeway and Peter thank for you. your willingness Thanks. to do this. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. I appreciate it. So those of you that feel called to reformers, and I don't know, some of you parents may know your youth in the youth group. I asked Peter today if youth were in. He said, no, I'm back with the youth today. Um, you could stand in for your kids if you know that that's the case. I know several of our youth that probably feel that. But if you feel a call, like a tug from the Lord that I, I actually am willing to, like, it could be a small thing, just in your neighborhood. It could be in your job. It could be in whatever set, setting. The challenge you have to face is the fact is you'll probably be countercultural. Um, but if you feel called to that, we just love to, I just love to pray for you and bless that. Some of you are going to be called in the academic arena, some in the theologic arena. I just don't know where it's going to go. Um, but I know this, that, um, I saw enough of a dead church in Europe, um, except for that spirit filled, like it was amazing, a spirit filled Catholic evangelical. I have no idea how to pocket that. It was like, whoa, <laughs> The nun prayed for me. I'm like, <laughs> it was like, that was awesome. <laughs> so I'd like to call you up. If you feel that's a stir for you, we're just, uh, let's put on some music and we just, I just want to invite you if you feel like Lord's tugged on you or this is something you could stand where you are. We're just, you're, you're, you're literally presenting yourself to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm willing, um, for me, it's been kind of a three-month journey of first saying, Lord, I think I'm willing, but like, what's this gonna cost? What's this look like? What's this mean? 
And um, I just don't know exactly what God's doing, but I know this, that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Jesus paid a price and there is hope. God wants to turn the tide in Western civilization and bring a worldwide harvest of a billion souls and a mighty revival. It will happen in the Catholic Church, the Charismatic Church, the Evangelical Church. It'll happen with business leaders, educators, people in media, arts, entertainment, all of the seven mountains that we know influence culture. So Father, I just pray for these, these standing, those watching online, these here that have said, yes, Lord, I want to at least present myself. I have no idea what this call is but I'm willing to be a, a reformational voice that, Lord, we're not going to see. We're not going to see our young people lost again. We're not going to see generations following these, these gods of Molech and Baal and Asherah. Lord, we thank you for the jubilee turning of Roe v. Wade that shifted a nation. Father, a jubilee is a time that you set things in righteousness. That's just happened. So, Lord, we're calling on a jubilee move of restoration. In a sense, our nation repented at the highest level. And so we're asking, Lord, that now your church would be empowered. That, Lord, you'd work in our hearts. We position our hearts to be like in that Josiah moment when he was 16, just seeking the Lord's face, hearing your voice, surrounding himself with godly counsel. Lord, would you just bless each of these that are standing, would you take note? And Lord, I thank you. Lord, just like Josiah, that hundreds of years earlier, a prophet said, there'll be someone named Josiah. Some of these here in this room are known by name. They've been called by the Lord to be a ref reformer in this hour. I thank you, Lord, that the prophetic voices of today are saying this is an era of reformation that there'll be a shift and that, that uh, our nation and the, the Western civilization will come back to the Lord because of the church that's repenting and is standing up in reformation. So Lord, I bless each of those here and I pray very specifically for dreams, for visitations, for prophetic revelation, for insight that would, would touch their hearts and would bless them. Lord, I bless our national gathering of women in October where they're gonna stand for our children and families in these issues. I thank you, Father, for the movements of the past, promise keepers, and um, the, the, the send. Lord, I thank you for the, the five, 6,000 gathered in, in London right now uh, where Violet's on the worship team and there's these worship leaders and they're calling a generation of Londonites to go be that reformers in their nation that's basically turned from you. Lord, would you do that in our hearts? And I bless each of these. Come with your spirit, move. Lord, speak to us. I know this starts with you speaking to our hearts. This word starts. I thank you for this, God, and I ask for your blessing on each of us. And Lord, it's sober. We, we don't necessarily need a whack from the Holy Spirit right now, but we need a moment of just hearing from you. I see you've got something, so I'm gonna, the mic is right there. Yeah, well, Peter was, was preaching there. I was like, the Lord just kept taking me to Gideon. And I just, I just feel like I wanted to encourage you reformers that have come forward that um, the enemy is scared of you. Just, just like when, when Gideon went down and listened in the enemy's camp, they were having dreams of the barley loaf coming in and smashing. They knew that was Gideon. The reality is the enemy knows that God's people, the reformers that have come forward, you are the ones that are gonna smash the enemy's camp. And, and he is more scared of you than you can imagine. So I just, I just wanna bless you with the reality that God has already gone ahead and created a fear in the enemy's camp of God's people. And if we will stand in that place, everything changes. You find out when you find out what Jim, on, is on Jim's mind. Just find out. Father, we, we invite a spirit of repentance. 
Lord says, return to me and I'll return to you. And so Lord, that could be a quiet thing in our heart, could be with weeping like in Joel, between the porch and the altar. But Lord, would you uh, give us resolve in our hearts as we've heard messages, I haven't been here, but I know that I listened to Peter's and that just called us back to the ways of the Lord. And would you move in our midst? Got a scripture. Okay, go ahead, Jim. Jim's got a scripture on this. The Lord gave me a scripture to read over each one of us. Isaiah 61 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. That's good. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, there's some other activity going on in the room. There, there are angels actually in the room that are offering an exchange of old armor for armor for reformation. So, so there's an opportunity to receive brand new equipment for this season. And there's also a scepter that's being extended, which is a symbol of authority to step into that. So we're, the protection and the equipping and the authority. And authority is permission. <laughs> permission to exercise the power of the Holy Spirit to transform the world around you. So I encourage you to just receive that gift that you're being given right now. If, if you need to just do a prophetic act, feel like you're putting on something new, just reach out, receive, lay, lay hold of that scepter is extending to you and, and, and take it as your own that you can carry it into the places God wants you to carry it into. Whoa. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I know this one hits home personally, but it, who up here in front are involved in the educational area, actually in our schools? If, you, if you're in that, lift your hands up. Yeah, I'd, I'd, if I can get some of my staff, I want you to lay hands on these ones with their hands. There, there's something extraordinary being released in them. There's several, all, put your hand all the way up so everybody can see. We get right here. We want to lay hands on it. Father, I just thank you for the exchange of that scepter right now. Father, I thank you for the release. For these you have already positioned. You have assigned in those areas. Father, in the name of Jesus, raise them up as the mouthpiece, the prophetic understanding, the, the know how to interact with what is being faced to them. And Lord, I pray you would release to them extraordinary favor with men. Father, we bless those in that particular arena specifically today in the name of Jesus. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we break the power of Behel, Ashtira, and Molech over our school systems in the name of Jesus. And Father, we pray those altars be torn down. In place, altars to the Lord be erected. May the cleansing take place in that arena in Jesus' name. So Scott took, talked about the, the Gideons, right? The Gideons, let me read to you. Paul just came up with a scripture. Uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. He did not feel that at the time he was hiding in fear. He was threshing wheat in the low place in the wine press, the exact opposite place to do it for fear that it would be stolen by the culture. And Gideon said, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? And where are all his wonderful deeds? Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now you've forsaken us into the hand of Midian. So that was a, 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 a God that raped the land, so to speak. The Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? Uh, he said, well, Lord, I am the weakest in my clan. I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said, I will be with you and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. 
So what, what's happening with that is you don't need to know what it means to be qualified to be a reformer. It's just the strength that something's wrong with the world and it needs an answer. And the Lord says, go, O mighty woman and man of valor, for I am with you. I have called you for this hour. And that's, he had no idea how he's going to defeat this, but the Lord unfolded that plan. So don't let your head get caught up in this. Just tell the Lord you're willing to be that. By the way, his first act was to tear down his father's bale and Asherah poles, just so you know. That's where he started, it was with repentance. So Father, I bless these Gideon 300, so to speak, that are willing to be reformers, but don't have a clue how to do it, feel like they're weak, they've been in fear, they don't know what they're to do, they don't know that they have a voice, they have no idea how this is to work, but you yourself came and you were the God that raised up the Gideon's army. And Lord, I bless each of us to be the Gideon's 300. Let this church be a, a church of 300. And I thank you, Father, that you will do this because you are with us as we make this commitment to just say, yes, Lord. And Lord, we uh, confess we have no earthly wisdom. We have no idea what this means, but we're just willing. We thank you for this. Thank you, Jesus.